Cool. All right. Uh, I'm Raul, uh, and uh, like Joey said, I work at Seven Shifts, and uh, I spend a lot of my time there, uh, probably too much time, just thinking about uh, this this one chart. And it's not a very good chart. I hope there's no data folks in the audience or anyone who's actually seen a chart, uh, but uh, that doesn't seem to matter. Uh, it, it still haunts me day and night. And so what this chart says is that uh, on, on the vertical axis here, you have architecture. And so this is the uh, level of architecture that you have applied to your software system. And on the horizontal axis is uh, the scale of your system by some metric. So that might be number of developers working on it, number of users, number of lines of code, probably some combination of those things. And so what the chart implies is that for any given product scale, there is an ideal level of ar architecture that uh, you should be applying to your system. And if you're above the line, then you're probably over-architecting things, uh, over-complicating things, and, and it's not actually paying off. And if you're below the line, well, then you, you probably don't have enough uh, structure. So this is the ideal. Uh, reality often looks a lot more like this. Um, you know, early on, you, there's no thought at all given to architecture, and at some point, you kind of hit this wall where you, you've been successful, which is great, but all of a sudden, um, you know, everything is broken all the time. Uh, you you release a, a bug fix, and you know, there's three more bugs caused by your bug fix, and uh, it's it's painful. Um, this is usually the point where you see companies start to re-architect their system, really start focusing on architecture. Often, this is where you see uh, rewrites or uh, migrating to a different architecture, migrating to microservices or, or some other distributed uh, architecture setup. Um, and sometimes, you know, you migrate to a new architecture or you rethink everything, you rewrite everything, and then you end up in an equally bad place, which is everything takes forever, right? Either because there's a ton of boilerplate or you have to coordinate 50 different services to get anything done. Um, and, and it's also not great. So it might seem like a lose-lose, but if you completely ignore architecture, then you're likely to end up in a place where uh, both of these things happen. Everything is broken all the time, and it takes forever to do anything. Um, so architecture is important. Um, when earlier in my career, uh, the people that, the companies I worked at, there was people who seemed to know the system architecture and the people that were designing the system architecture, they always seemed like these really, really smart people who had some sort of secret knowledge and it wasn't really clear how you, how you got that. And uh, I've been lucky enough to work in places where, where that was actually true, like that the people doing the architecture were actually very smart. Um, but now, <laughs> uh, now that, uh, you know, I've, I've been at Seven Shifts and, and I spend a lot of my time there uh, thinking about architecture, talking about architecture, and, and helping define the architecture, I realized that basically you only need to know three things um, to be an architect. Uh, and the first one is you need to be able to draw boxes and arrows. So if you got a kindergarten grasp of drawing, then you're off to a good start. Uh, the second thing is understanding dependencies. And uh, this the concept of dependencies, uh, I'm kind of embarrassed to say that it, it took me a lot longer to, to wrap my head around than, than I think it, it should have. And I think a lot of the reason for that is um, we, we use that term a lot in very different contexts, and we also attach like other concepts to it. So you know, sometimes we talk about dependency injection, and our system we have a dependency injection container, and we talk about dependency inversion, and those things you know they, they do have complexities. But uh, dependencies in software really it means you have one chunk of code, and it knows something about another chunk of code, and that something might be a class name, it might be a method name arguments, whatever, something. And that knowledge creates a dependency. And if this piece of code changes, it might force the other one to change. And that that's basically it. That's all you really need to know uh, about uh, dependencies, at least uh, to, to define architecture. And the third thing is the only actually hard thing about architecture. Uh, and this is why I think you often see the most experienced folks um, driving the architecture. And that's weighing trade-offs. Um, and 
the reason this is hard is because it, it just requires a lot of context. It can require understanding a lot about the company and the company's history. It can be require knowing a lot about the software system. It can require context on uh, on different technologies, and on all that context is uh, is super important to make good decisions on trade offs. Uh, now that said, um, there's no reason that anyone can't understand some of these things, right? Understanding the company goals, like anyone can do that. So, you know, understand your company goals, uh, understand the software's role in achieving those goals. Um, uh, try out different tech, you know, that that's something that uh, often becomes really helpful in architecture is, you know, if you have a brand new dev and they've only ever used one database, say like MySQL, well, they, their understanding of what databases are capable might be limited to MySQL. Whereas if you have a dev who's, you know, seen like five different databases, they, they kind of uh, understand what what's possible. So trying out different tech, and that doesn't mean you have to go build something with every new piece of technology, um, you know, read the docs or just talk to someone who's used that technology and uh, get an understanding of uh, where it's useful. Uh, and the last thing is just understanding the downsides. Uh, super important to making good decisions. And sometimes you find this piece of technology and it seems super great and, and just awesome and you want to use it for everything. Um, but if you can't say anything bad about that piece of technology, you probably don't understand it well enough. So uh, search for the downsides. I promise you they're there. Um, yeah, so uh, I found that many successful uh, software startups, especially you know web-based software, they tend to follow a similar path uh, to what Seven Shifts went through. Um, you know, they start out small. We, when I joined Seven Shifts, this was five plus years ago, uh, you know, we were 10 people, the entire company, 10 people, we all fit in one room. We did one stand up as entire company. Uh, communication was easy. Uh, we had customers, but you know, not, not a ton of customers. We had two tiny teams, uh, one web team and one mobile team each of three, three-ish people, the code base was fairly small, and we deployed, you know, a few times a week or so. Um, fast forward five years, and, you know, the, the company's grown quite a bit. It's 16 times plus the number of employees. This number's probably already wrong because we've been hiring a lot. Uh, the number of locations using 7Shifts has, has also gone 20x times up. Uh, we have a lot more teams, a lot more developers. Uh, the code base is just bigger, and we deploy a lot more. The uh, The application might get deployed 15 times a day, 10 times a day. It, it varies quite a bit. So like many of the successful uh, web startups over the last 20 years, 7Shifts started out as an uh, MVC web app. Um, this MVC is super, super common architecture among web applications, especially over the last 20 years. and. Uh, part of the reason it's so popular is just it's very simple. You have a component that is responsible for uh, the UI, which is the view. Uh, you have the controller that um, uh, presents the UI and then also deals with interactions from the UI. And then you have the model, which deals with uh, persisting your core, core domain objects and, and also includes uh, your core, core business logic. Uh, and so the arrows here are those uh, dependencies I talked about, right? So the things that have an arrow going to uh, across them uh, know something about each other. So what tends to happen with these is, uh, as the <laughs> as the product is successful, um, the model component seems to just explode in complexity. And uh, I'm absolutely convinced that at the heart of every successful uh, MVC app, there's a giant user model that's like thousands of lines long, just nobody understands it. If you want to make a change to it, it requires like five reviews from like the most senior people. If you want to deploy it, it requires like synchronized keys, you know, it's just like craziness. Uh, maybe that's just us, I don't know. Uh, and the other, the other part that seems to explode in complexity is the view. And uh, Often that, that tends to be because of JavaScript. Um, if you've uh, created an MVC app in the last 10 years, I'm sure you've accumulated like six different JavaScript frameworks and uh, you still got jQuery in there, they just can't get rid of. Uh, so th the view tends to get really complicated. Uh, and so certainly this is uh, where we, we ended up. Um, and there's a lot of bad things here. Uh, 
change becomes really risky, which is which is really bad for, for a number of reasons. But you might deploy a change and it somehow affects subtly in some unpredictable way uh, some other part of the app somewhere. Uh, it's also hard to know who's responsible for what. Uh, you know, when we were th three web developers uh, and like a bug came up, I'd be like, you know, we're, we're within arm's length of each other. I'd be like, hey, Martina, are you going to fix this bug? No. Ryan, are you going to fix this bug? No. I guess I'm fixing the bug. Uh, <laughs> it, was, it was easy. Uh, but as, as you get more teams and more people, uh, it becomes a lot harder. Knowledge, knowledge silos is another thing. Uh, you get certain parts of the system that like only one person understands. And you know, if that person leaves, that knowledge leaves with them. And more often than not, like it's never recovered, right? Like the next time someone needs to change it, like they just rewrite the thing because like it's impossible. Um, so this is the point I mentioned where you know often rearchitectures happen, the dreaded rewrites happen, um, or you know just more focus uh, is put on on architecture. So I want to walk through four high-level architecture patterns that we've applied to our code base that have helped us get from that painful point to where we are today, where our system is a lot more scalable and a lot easier to, to build on. So the first one is layers. So layers might be the oldest uh, architecture pattern in existence, and that's because it's... Um, it's super versatile, super simple to understand. There's basically two rules to uh, layers, and that's that one, you're grouping code by common function, right? So you might group uh, all your UI code into a layer because you know it's all UI code. Uh, you're gonna also group your database code into one layer. Um, and the second rule is that, um, uh, what am I trying to say here? Uh, the, 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 uh, second rule is just that uh, layers can't know anything about the layers above them, right? Um, so layers can only know things about uh, layers below them, and uh, that that simplifies things quite a bit. It means that you can swap out higher level layers, uh, and it doesn't. You don't have to change anything about the lower level layers. Uh, so if we look at our MVC architecture here. Uh, if we squint and maybe like, can, can we move things around and just, just turn it into layers? And you kind of can. Uh, it almost works. I mean, <laughs> uh, it's almost layers. Um, it, there's, uh, there's a couple weird things going on. The controller and, and the view know about each other. Uh, the view knows directly about the model, which can be a little awkward. So when we ran into this, um, the, the solution seemed kind of obvious because we had already had uh, some good mobile applications, right? And those mobile applications were basically the view layer uh, for mobile. And they communicated with our backend via an API. So the obvious thing to do was just to pull our view layer out into its own application. So we pulled it out into a React app that communicated with th the same APIs that um, our mobile apps did. And uh, that that's worked pretty well. Um, so for the rest of the talk, since we've pulled these out in, uh, into separate systems, I'm going to ignore the, the the view layer. And each one of these now uh, you know, has a lot of interesting challenges on its own and really interesting architecture that gets applied to them. And uh, I hope someone else will give a talk on that. Um, so all right, so then this is what we're left with. Uh, we still have the problem of this massive model. It's just a huge pain. Uh, so it turns out that Models typically they're doing two kind of separate things, uh, or at least things that that kind of make sense to pull apart, and that's persistence. So actually storing your objects in the database, and then what uh, what we think of as domain logic, right? These are your core business rules, those core uh, domain objects. And early on, it can you know it can make a lot of sense to have those tied together. It makes things really easy if you have a user object that has these fields that get saved to a single user table with those exact same fields, and you know it makes sense for those uh, to be the same thing. But as the app gets more complex, that's not always the case, and then mapping these gets uh, really painful and uh, is, is one of the sources of um, complexity in, in the model. So we're just, seems obvious, we're gonna, we're gonna pull that out into its own layer. We're gonna create a domain layer. Um, and then the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna actually combine our <coughs> persistence and our controllers into a layer that we call the infrastructure layer. Um, so this might 
not seem obvious, like what do these things have in common? Um, but the thing they, they kind of have in common is that they both kind of deal with things external to, to the system itself, right? In the case of controllers, they deal with HTTP requests. And in the case of persistence, um, they deal with uh, communicating with the database. And these are also things that are likely to change, right? And so like, if we want to switch databases, if we're on MySQL, but we want to use Postgres, um, this allows us to do that without affecting our, our domain layer at all. Or if we want to use Redis, or if we want to use all three of those, uh, we can do that. Or if instead of calling our code from an HTTP request, we want to call it from a CLI or something. So this is kind of where we're at. Uh, so we're going to do one more thing, and we're going to uh, we're going to add another layer in there that that we call the application layer. So the application layer is basically just a coordination layer. It deals with, it contains all the operations that our system supports. So it might have a create user operation or a delete user operation, a list users operation. Um, and so those are contained within the application layer and the application layer is, is uh, concerned with um, putting together all the domain objects to actually you know, get those things done, like, like deleting a user. Uh, if it's not obvious why this is useful or if it seems uh, just like unnecessary complexity, that's okay. We'll we'll talk about the benefits a bit more a bit later. Um, but yeah, we kind of end up with this nice um, this nice layered architecture. Uh, this has solved already a bunch of problems for us. The dependency direction is very clear, right? Dependencies only go down. Um, if we want to get rid of a controller or if we want to change a controller, it doesn't you know, affect uh, things in, in the domain layer. Uh, so that's already given us a lot of flexibility. So the next pattern is uh, CQRS. This is maybe one of the most misunderstood architecture patterns I've come across and also misapplied. Um, but basically, the idea is that you separate um, your code into two distinct domain models, or you can think of them as just two code paths. One for writes, right? Things that you know are get written to the database or things that have side effects. Um, and one for reads, which is you know just like pulling data out of your system. And in some cases, it turns out that these two things, they have very different requirements. Um, and sometimes you end up with all this complexity in your domain model that is only really needed for the writes or the commands, right? And so this kind of frees you to use a completely different domain model and drastically simplify uh, the read side. So I've heard this is useful. Um, <laughs> I have not experienced that myself. Uh, in, in my experience, it adds a lot of complexity. Uh, and, you know, well, in my experience, it, it doesn't really pay, pay back that, uh, that added complexity. But what we do do, or what we've taken from this, is this idea of commands and queries. And so within our application layer specifically, we do segment all those operations I mentioned into either uh, read operations, uh, query operations, or command operations. So you might find a read user query and a delete user command in, in our system. Uh, and separating them like this has a few benefits. For one, it gives us the freedom later on. If we want to you know, completely split uh, our domain model, we can do that. Maybe there's very specific use cases where we want to do that. Um, but it also allows us to build extra functionality um, on top of these things. So for instance, uh, for commands, we have a special object called the command bus, and that's how we actually trigger the execution of, uh, of a command. And so if you wanted to fire off the delete user command, this is how you do it. You'd grab the command bus, and you'd call execute and, and pass it this um, delete user command. So the great thing about this is you can call this code anywhere. All you need is like that, you know, that delete user command object and the command bus. And so that means you can call this from uh, HTTP controller, or you can call it from a CLI, or you can call it from a REPL. That's super nice for uh, debugging. And the other cool thing we have is we have uh, this other method called execute async. And what this does is it, it also runs the command, but it will run it asynchronously. So in our case, it's going to just run it on the queue. And so what you end up with is that every single operation in our system can be run synchronously or asynchronously and doesn't really care about the context from which it's being run. And that, uh, that's actually super, super powerful. All right. 
Um, so that's all great. And that has solved a bunch of problems and simplified our life quite a bit. But we still have the problem that I mentioned at the start where, you know, there's like one user object and it's being used everywhere, right? There's nothing preventing our user object in the domain from being uh, depended on by a bunch of code uh, across our very massive application layer. So we actually, we need a way to break this code down even more. We've also haven't solved the issue of like who is responsible for what. It's still kind of confusing. Uh, so for this, we, we kind of turn to domain-driven design. And domain-driven design is it's a, a book um, full of really, really great ideas and great patterns uh, buried in probably the densest book I have ever sort of read. Um, <laughs> but one of the uh, most common uh, patterns in there, and one of the most useful, is this idea of a bounded context. So, well, with layers, you know, we're kind of doing these horizontal slices where we're um, grouping code by um, by function. What bounded contexts kind of tell us to do is to uh, group code by more by workflows um, instead of you know likeness, um, functional likeness, and so. We've done that with our system, and so we end up with something like this, where there's a scheduling bounded context, a billings um, bounded context, a reporting bounded context, and there's there's a bunch more. This is also a common pattern that's applied to you know microservices when you when it comes time to split your microservices, you might you know use this idea to to decide what uh, what should be a service, and yeah, so this solves uh, kind of those remaining problems where. Now, if scheduling has some object, like in our case, we have this like a shift object in, in their domain, uh, you know, reporting isn't just going to randomly depend on it, right? They have to, if they want to get something out of scheduling, they have to communicate over a well-defined API. And this also makes uh, ownership really clear, right? We can assign these to specific teams. So there's a team that owns scheduling, and if there's an issue with scheduling, you know who to talk to. Uh, and these aren't purely like technical concepts. Are Product managers also, you know, they use the same term. So when they talk about scheduling, you know, they mean the, the same thing that a developer means when, when they talk about scheduling. All right, so the, the final um, final pattern is the, the idea of events. Uh, again, super common pattern in distributed systems, but turns out it's actually super useful in monolithic applications as well. Um, and high level, what this solves is you can imagine a case where the billing bounded context is responsible for a user canceling their account or changing their plan or something. And when that happens, well, a whole bunch of other stuff has to happen across the system, whether it's just like cleanup or, or whatever else. And you know, the the straightforward way you would maybe think to do that is uh, billing knows that uh, a user's account was canceled, and so they you know they tell scheduling, hey, scheduling, you need to do this thing. Uh, reporting, hey, you need to do this thing. But it puts all this knowledge on billing that they need to bo know about all these other contexts. And it creates kind of this, this strong dependency uh, where billing knows way too much about uh, scheduling and reporting. So events basically let you reverse that and, and really weaken uh, that dependency. And so now billing can just fire off an event uh, you know, broadcast this event to anyone who, who cares about it saying a user account was canceled, you know, do with that whatever whatever you want to do. And often in distributed systems, this is, you know, built on top of like uh, some pub sub system or, you know, some um, queuing system. But uh, a really simple implementation of this is just like, you know, you just loop through uh, everyone that said they care about this and just like, synchronously uh, call their event handlers. And uh, that actually works surprisingly well, and we've done it for a long time. We, we have an async version that you know uses kind of like a pub sub system. But um, yeah, we still have events that just happen synchronously. And while you don't get the, the async benefit, you do get the, um, the lower dependency benefit. So it uh, works quite well. Uh, all right, so those, those are kind of the patterns. Um, it turns out that uh, designing your architecture is actually not the hardest part. Uh, the hardest part is actually implementing it and, and doing it successfully. If, um, if your architecture is not being used consistently, uh, it's not, um, not going to be very effective. Right? The effectiveness is, is largely dictated by the level of adoption. 
So there's a few things that I think that we've learned and mistakes we've made uh, in, in actually getting our architecture adopted that I think are super useful to know going in. Um, the first thing is to really figure out what's important, what's important to your architecture. Uh, and it can't be everything. Uh, if everything's important, nothing is. So you really have to, you know, pick and choose. I'd say you can generally pick like two or three of these things, right? But what do you care about most? You care most about security, like are you a banking app or something? Then that, that might make sense. Do you care most about speed, uh, user experience? Uh, flexibility, do you have no idea what you're going to be adding, you know, months from now? And so you, you really just need a system to be flexible. Uh, and ideally, you're doing this before you define your architecture, but, you know, uh, better late than never. Um, the other thing that I think is super important for uh, successful architecture is getting everyone involved. I mentioned at the start that really, like, anyone can contribute to this. Uh, you, you know, you need three skills. Um, so it's, uh, it's super important to cultivate a shared understanding, make sure everyone understands your architecture, uh, and not just how to follow it, but if at all possible, also the understanding the trade-offs that uh, the architecture is making and why. Um, having a single place where people can go and read about the architecture or understand it is really great. The way we do this now is we have a GitHub repo, uh, we call it engineering docs, but that's where our, uh, our department processes live and it's also where our architecture is defined. And what that means is that anyone, right, any developer, everyone has access to this repo can go in there and they can make a pull request and request a change. And when, you know, a more senior person is developing the architecture to start out, they do it in the same repo. So it's all done in the open and uh, everyone can, um, Everyone can contribute. Everyone can have their their ideas heard. Some people worry about this. They worry that you end up with this kind of like design by committee situation where you build this thing that you know takes everyone's ideas and tries to please everyone, and you you end up with something that's that's terrible. Um, and I always say that the goal of this system is not consensus. The goal is alignment. So there is still going to be a decision maker here, and they might not. You know, listen to everyone's uh, opinions. Uh, sorry, they will listen to everyone's opinions. <laughs> <laughs> they may not incorporate every uh, single person's opinions, or they may not do what everyone wants. But the goal is to really give them as much context as possible, so they have that context to make the best trade-offs and the best uh, decisions that they can make. Um, yeah. So hopefully uh, you found this interesting. Uh, if you found this interesting and uh, you know you have uh, a lot of thoughts on this, please come chat with me. I'd love to hear how your experiences are similar or have been different. Uh, if you found this interesting, but a lot of it didn't make sense to you uh, and you'd like to learn more about some of these subjects, uh, also please come chat with me. Uh, if you didn't find this interesting, then uh, please sign up to give a dev talk. I'd love to hear <laughs> what you do find interesting. Thanks.